reading is from Acts chapter 8, verses 25 to 40. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Philip and the Ethiopian. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means the Queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before it, shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him about the good news of Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. There we go. Can you hear me now? That's perfect. Well done. Great. Um, I'll just wait for the uh, PowerPoint to come up. Um, It's a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Kaz, for that reading. I also just want to say thank you to Ella. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but I just found the worship this morning amazing. So thank you. It's a lot easier to stand here and preach when the service just lifts you up like that. And we've had three testimonies, haven't we, this morning? And to a certain extent, I hope in some way I can weave that into what I'm going to talk about because I think they've probably done my sermon for me. So thanks, guys. That was amazing, too. But I have prepared something on Philip (coughs) and the Ethiopian. So, as Stephen said, we are continuing our series about encountering God. We've looked at Abraham. Daniel and Isaiah. They are all huge characters of the Old Testament, and they all bring different characteristics, I think, of God, and they're all pointing, aren't they, towards our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to look at encountering God through others, just like each of our testimonies talked about. As we focus on this encounter with God through Philip, I pray that you will be reminded of all of those who have enabled you in the past to encounter God and feel that desire to be the person to do that for others. I believe we can probably all be Philip and we can all be the Ethiopian. Before I start, we will look at some context, um, but I'm also just going to put a little bit of a um, confession out there. I did the notes for this around Wednesday, and actually the preach has changed quite considerably since then. So if you're a life group leader, and I can see a few of you, you might have to work a bit harder this week than normal. So my apologies for that. So, um, right, let's start with some context first. It's been really good to do this as we've gone through these encounters. So, the book of Acts. 
written, we think, in about AD 63, and almost definitely by Luke. It can be described as the sequel to Luke's gospel and is often described as a bridge from the gospels to the rest of the New Testament. Historically, it recounts the first 30 years of the church. The objective, I love an objective, it's just the way um, I'm taught at work. The objective of the book of Acts is to demonstrate how Jesus' words in Acts 1, 8 came into being. And you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Luke is credited by scholars as having written an historical, objective, dramatic piece of literal excellence. And so we come to this point in the story. And at this point, let's just do a quick run of Acts. We have seen Christ's ascension. We've seen the Holy Spirit descend. We have seen thousands converted and miracles take place. And this has led to the arrest of the apostles. We've seen the choosing of the seven, those full of the spirit and wisdom, one of whom was Philip. We've also seen the stoning of Stephen and the scattering of the disciples. And that's where we are as we pick up this story. And for me, this is a really critical point in the narrative. Up till now, the good news has been shared in pretty much one place, Jerusalem. It's been shared by the apostles, and they've been focusing on the Jewish people. And yet we've just heard Jesus' commission was to go out to the ends of the earth. And beyond this point, this is what's going to happen So if you fast forwarded through Acts, we're going to have the conversion of Saul. And he is going to become known as the preacher of the Gentiles. Cornelius is called to Peter. Peter's vision and subsequent conversion of the whole of Cornelius' house. Peter is going to lead a discussion with the other disciples to accept Gentile believers. He's going to persuade them that the good news should be shared with them. And then we're going to watch the church planting all over the ancient world. But we have this small story right in the middle of that. So just preceding our scripture, Kaz just read it out to us. Philip is in Samaria and he's preaching. This man who is full of the spirit and wisdom is in Samaria. Samaria, where Jews would have avoided traveling. Samaria, where Jesus has gone before and he is preaching. He is seeing miracles performed, demons cast out, by anyone's standard, a successful ministry. And then we start with the words, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And the next words, so he starts out. He didn't plead to stay where he was. He didn't highlight the success of his ministry to date. He started out. I think probably we need to just pause for a moment on those words. I know Stephen's been talking about those four words you might want to remember this week. And for me, these are some of them. Encounters with God, it seems from this story, is an active process. It starts with Philip being willing, obeying, and starting out. A little bit like Steve just talked about when he came across his friend. He needed to be looking out. This is about starting out. Whatever our starting out point might be, whether we understand, like Julie, the why or the why not, 
almost doesn't matter. We still have to start out from somewhere. It might be our own anxiety, our bereavement, our joy, or our success. The Holy Spirit will prompt us. And we have to start out. And yes, like David last week, I think this is practical. We might be asked to go on a journey, to make more time for the Lord, to read the scriptures, do it in a different way, speak to new people, take on a new challenge. But I think there'll be a practical working out. Coming back to our story. So he started out and on the way he met an Ethiopian. Philip is walking in obedience. He is of one mind with the Holy Spirit. Obedience is a little bit like the word holiness. It can make us feel uncomfortable and we can think of it as being a bit old fashioned. I thought David did a wonderful job last week just highlighting that word holiness. In John's gospel, Jesus uses these words in John 14, 15. He is preparing his disciples for his death and he says this to them. If you love me, you will obey me. You will obey what I command. We've heard about Abraham obeying God. And as Andrew spoke about the sacrificing of Isaac, we see obedience almost beyond our understanding. Daniel obeyed his God by continuing in his practices and keeping himself holy to be a living witness. Isaiah obeyed God and spoke truth to power over and over again. Jesus' mission, one of total obedience. It's a challenge, but from this passage we can see it's essential. Where do we need to walk in obedience and stop rebelling? And then perhaps we need to focus on the Ethiopian. What is he doing? He is preparing. He may not have known it, but he's been to Jerusalem, we've heard, to worship. He knows what he knows of the Jewish customs. He's reading the scripture, but he doesn't understand it. He's not close enough to a traditional rabbi to receive their interpretation. But he invites Philip into his chariot to hear the good news. He is prepared and he is open. I'd like to tell you a small story here about being at work. I would have used it as a testimony, but I kept it back. Um, over the past couple of years that I've worked in this particular organization, I've been able to introduce myself as a reader in training, a lay minister. And some people are curious. They want to know a bit more. What on earth does that mean, they'll ask me. Some want to talk about their own journey of faith. They can see a connection. They'd like to just talk that through with me. And some even ask for advice. But two weeks ago, I was at a work conference in the Celtic Manor in Newport, Wales. I was sitting down to a lovely meal with our whole business unit. And I sat opposite a young man called Ahmed. He's a new father and a young Muslim. As I sat down, Ahmed leaned across the table and he said to me, I've been waiting for an opportunity to talk to you, Liz. Now, in the virtual world that I exist in now, that's actually much harder than you might think. So I wasn't quite sure what was coming next. I'd like to ask you questions about your faith. That's direct. And he did. He centered all of his questions, and they were quick fire around Jesus. I kind of wasn't expecting it, but I probably had also assumed that the theologians had dealt with most of this already. Questions like, did Jesus really die on the cross? Didn't they just move his, daughter, did move his body? Are coming at me really quickly. 
I honestly don't know how well I answered his questions. But I listened to where he was, and I spoke from my heart about my beliefs and my faith. I don't know how well I identify with Philip, the evangelist. Looking back, did I feel that this would be the way the evening would go? No, absolutely not. Did an angel appear and ask me to go to the pad restaurant in the Celtic manor? No. But was Ahmed prepared and open? Yes, he was. And he invited me to share, just like the Ethiopian. And whilst it was really quite hard to adjust my responses to where Ahmed was, I tried. And like Philip, I did start where he was. Do we believe Ahmed could have encountered the living God through that conversation with me? I really hope so. I really hope so. But when I looked back, what struck me about the conversation was not what I said. But it was that Ahmed, who is a practicing young Muslim man, is so incredibly curious about Jesus. He was completely open to what I was saying. I think we can only pray that God will equip us live within us for such an opportunity as this, that his Holy Spirit will give us the words as we have been promised on these occasions. I can hear some of you saying to me, St. Paul tells us in the Corinthians 12 that we will have different gifts, and one of them is evangelism, and we may not feel that that is our gift, but come on we can all identify with the Ethiopian. We all need an encounter with God. Are we prepared? Are we reading our scripture? Are there passages we struggle with? Have we asked for help? Have we asked God to send someone who can support us, to teach us, help us to see the truth? Do you want to encounter God? As a life group coordinator, I'm going to make a plug here for the life groups, so forgive me. <laughs> it is one of the things we do. We study scripture together. We share our views. We learn from each other. We support each other. And we lean into each other. Just like the Ethiopian is leaning on Philip. For a moment, let's also look at the Ethiopian and his response. So he was open, he was prepared, and he received. He saw a stretch of water, and he wanted to be baptized. Some other words I love in this passage. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Was there a discussion? Did we have a big meeting about it? Was the concept of worthiness debated? Just a question. No. They got out of the chariot, they went down into the water, and Philip baptised him. Before, let's just remember where we are in this story. Before there was any agreement among the apostles, the very friends and followers of Jesus, Philip a man full of spirit and wisdom, baptized an Ethiopian eunuch, and that Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing. And legend has it, he went on and converted a nation. How I want to be an Ethiopian, open and prepared to encounter God. But sometimes... I find myself acting a little bit more like Pharaoh in the Old Testament Exodus story. Presented with Moses' request, encountering God through so many miracles, yet finding the request sacrificial 
and closing my heart to it. Hardening my heart. Getting on with daily business, not interested in the part that I am supposed to play in the story. The outcome for Pharaoh is horrific. He sees many miracles, and yet he cannot and will not open to the living God. How much that contrasts with this Ethiopian. I pray constantly that I will not be a Pharaoh. And maybe I would like to see myself as a Philip. But perhaps what I should most be praying for is to be the Ethiopian to be open to the encounter, to act, to be baptized, to rejoice in the good news. And wherever I can, and wherever I'm prompted, pass on that good news in the way that God equips me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that as we leave this holy place today, we will be changed, transformed, more into the likeness of Christ by being open to that encounter with God that you so want to give us. I pray that as we go through this week, we will be open, prepared, eager for that encounter and that we will not let our hearts be hardened. I pray for us all that we can be people filled with the spirit and wisdom, willing to be equipped by God to share the very, very good news of Jesus Christ's life, death, and <coughs> resurrection. Amen. <laughs>